Do you believe you can truly break free from the shackles of this world in just a few moments? Most would say it's impossible. But what if I told you that the key to profound transformation lies hidden in a truth that defies all conventional wisdom? Yes, even in a world that seems ruled by chaos, you can experience a transformed life swiftly. Today we're going to unveil an ancient secret that not only reveals how to become a person led by the Spirit, but also how this counterintuitive truth can change your existence here and now. Are you ready to challenge your deepest beliefs and discover the power that can reshape your life in an instant? Stay with us and I promise you'll never see the world in the same way again. Jesus explained why you don't fit into this world. What does it mean to say that Christians are not of this world? The phrase not of this world appears in John 18.36, where Jesus declares that his kingdom does not belong to this world. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. In this statement, Jesus was being interrogated by Pontius Pilate during one of his trials. Pilate had called Jesus into the palace and was trying to understand the charges against him, practically asking Jesus to incriminate himself. As the Roman governor in Judea, Pilate had the critical duty of maintaining peace and order. Conversely, the Jewish Sanhedrin had different plans and sought Jesus' death, sending him to Pilate, knowing only he had the power to order the execution. John 19.10 records Pilate questioning Jesus. Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have the power to free you and the power to crucify you? To convince Pilate that Jesus was a threat to Roman stability, Caiaphas, the high priest, accused him of proclaiming himself king. This accusation suggested Jesus was rallying rebel forces to start a revolution against Roman authority. In Luke chapter 23, 2-5, they began accusing Jesus, saying, We found this man subverting our nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and claiming to be Christ, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, You have said so. Pilate then told the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. Caiaphas hoped Pilate would decide to execute Jesus to prevent any potential uprising. When Pilate questioned Jesus about being a king, he likely had a political role in mind, suspecting Jesus could be accused of inciting a rebellion against Caesar. However, by stating his kingdom was not of this world, Jesus refuted the notion of being a king in the conventional sense. This point was further underscored by the fact that none of his followers fought to free him. Jesus acknowledges his kingship, but clarifies that his kingdom does not belong to this world, hinting at his heavenly origin by stating he came into the world to bear witness to the truth. John 18.37 recounts Pilate asking, and Jesus responds, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The kingdom of the Almighty is heavenly and encompasses the thoughts and emotions of its followers, having no origin in this world, not deriving from earthly power, physical strength, material wealth, or armed forces. As Christians, we are followers of Jesus Christ and members of his kingdom, which is not of this world. We know our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3, 17, 20, where Paul reminds us that while some live as enemies of the cross of Christ, focused on worldly and temporary pleasures, we eagerly await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In response to Pilate's question, Jesus declared that his kingdom was not of this world, indicating he required no earthly defense, for his realm was not established in this domain. Although Jesus ruled over an empire, he did not pose a political threat to Rome, and his servants did not need to fight to protect him. Jesus forbade his disciples from intervening to prevent his arrest, as illustrated in John 18.10. 
11 when Peter attempted to defend Jesus and was rebuked. After conversing with Jesus, Pilate concluded that he did not intend to incite a rebellion and therefore did not pose a threat to Rome. As a result, Pilate informed the Jewish leaders that he found no basis for a charge against Jesus. In John 8, 20, 23, Jesus shares profound truths while teaching in the temple courts. He revealed that his departure was imminent and that, although they would look for him, they could not follow him, remaining in their sins and consequently separated from where he would be. The confusion among the Jews was tangible, wondering if he was hinting at taking his own life by saying, where I go, you cannot come. However, Jesus clarified the fundamental distinction between them and himself. You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world, this. His teaching was deepened in John 14, where Jesus confides to his disciples that the prince of this world, referring to Satan, has no hold over him. This statement is a powerful reminder that, although evil may seem to prevail, it has no ultimate authority over those who belong to the kingdom of Christ. John 17, 14, 16 echoes this message, where Jesus prays to the Father not to take his followers out of the world, but to protect them from the evil one. He acknowledges that, just as he is not of this world, his followers are not either. This distinction is not physical, but spiritual and moral. It's a matter of loyalty, values, and mission. The kingdom of Christ, therefore, is not based on human power structures, material wealth, or territorial conquests. It is established in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The statement, my kingdom is not of this world, points to the origin and character of Christ's kingdom, underlining that his power and influence come from a superior authority outside this world, specifically from our Heavenly Father. Christ's governance is not crafted by human hands, but has a divine origin. This focus on the spiritual nature and mission of God's kingdom offers a transformative perspective. It's not about external conformity or adherence to ritual practices, but living a life marked by righteousness, peace, and joy that flows from a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's an invitation to align our hearts and lives with the values of God's kingdom, navigating this world as citizens of a heavenly realm, bringing light and hope to a world often marked by division and despair. In Romans 14, 17, we learn that while earthly kingdoms are grounded in this world, the kingdom of Christ is distinguished by its spiritual nature, originating from heaven. This kingdom infuses the world with life, as illustrated in John 6:33, where it is said that the bread of God is the one that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Although the Lord's kingdom is not of this world, it holds authority over it and has a significant impact. Jesus Christ and his disciples follow higher, not earthly, orders. As believers, we are encouraged to set our minds on things above, not on earthly things, as Colossians 3, 1, 2 directs us to seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, keeping our focus habitually on heavenly matters. The Apostle Peter emphasizes the importance of prioritizing obedience to God over human authority when it comes to following the law, as seen in Acts 5.29, where he and the other apostles responded, we must obey God rather than men. As followers of Jesus, we are citizens of the kingdom of Christ. This earth is not our permanent home. 1 John 2.15 17 cautions us against loving the world and the things in the world for everything in it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life does not come from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Our primary allegiance as believers is to our supreme authority, King Jesus, and we belong to a heavenly citizenship. Like Jesus, we can assert that our kingdom is not of this world. We engage in spiritual battles, but the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, 
We are reminded that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. This verse underscores that as individuals who believe in God, our primary focus should be to place utmost importance on the kingdom of God and live according to its principles of righteousness. We find comfort in the fact that our King has granted us the blessing of eternal life and that those who follow God's will live forever, while the temptations and pleasures of the world will eventually perish. Though our current existence is on earth, our stay here is but momentary compared to the infinity of eternity. James 4.14 warns us about the arrogance of presuming to know our future or judging others, reminding us of our transient nature and God's sovereignty over our lives. This world in its present form is passing away. The trials and sufferings we face are inevitable, but as believers, we must remember that our true home is not of this world. This awareness offers us hope even in the darkest moments, as expressed in 1 Peter 1, 6, 9. These verses speak of the joy that comes from genuine faith, tested and purified like gold by fire, which will result in praise, glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The salvation of our souls is the ultimate and glorious outcome of this faith, bringing us inexpressible and glorious joy. Thus, as we navigate through this broken world, we keep our eyes fixed on the unshakable kingdom that awaits us. Our faith and hope in Jesus Christ are not based on what we see or experience now, but on the promise of an eternal inheritance, free from the pains, sufferings and imperfections of this world. We are encouraged to live lives that reflect the values of the coming kingdom, knowing that our stay here is only temporary, and what awaits us is an eternal and immutable realm. Hebrews 13.14 reminds us that here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. This passage echoes the truth that, as followers of Jesus, we belong to a kingdom beyond this world. We have been chosen by God to inherit the blessings of heaven, and it is there that our true home lies. This perspective encourages us to live differently, with our eyes fixed on eternity. Hebrews 12.28 reinforces this idea by telling us that since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. This directs us to live with gratitude and worship towards God, demonstrating our appreciation for the eternal kingdom promised to us. In Titus 3, 7, we are reminded that through God's compassionate and undeserved grace, we are justified and made heirs of eternal life, a hope we experience now and await in its fullness. As we await the return of our King, we hold on to hope and do what we can to bring others into this transcendental relationship with Jesus Christ, as expressed in Titus 2.13, where we await the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 5. 5 assures us that this hope in God's promises will never disappoint us, for God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This love is the source of our hope and perseverance. The Bible speaks in various ways about believers' condition as pilgrims or strangers in this world. 1 Peter 2.10 11 calls us foreigners and exiles on the earth, urging us to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. This concept aligns with the idea that our true citizenship, as mentioned in Philippians 3.20, is in heaven. Our heavenly citizenship, as mentioned in Philippians 3.20, places us in a unique position in this world, transforming us into spiritual pilgrims in the purest sense of the word. This transformation stems from God choosing us, for He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will, as Ephesians 1, 4, 5 tells us. This election marks the transition from an earthly to a heavenly identity. 
As we are reborn, as the Bible describes, we become new creations. Our old selves no longer feel at home in this world. Thus, we are transformed into spiritual foreigners, no longer belonging to this world, but to a heavenly kingdom. Drawing connections between our fascination with extraterrestrial beings and our spiritual identity as foreigners can indeed be enlightening. Just as we are intrigued by the idea of life beyond Earth, we can also find fascination in our spiritual journey as outsiders in this world. This perspective can provide a unique sense of purpose and belonging, reminding us that there is more to existence than just what we perceive and experience on Earth. But what does this change in our daily lives? As spiritual pilgrims, we live under a new constitution, the New Testament, we follow a new king, Jesus Christ. Our desires and longings change as we seek to align with our heavenly citizenship. This transformation is beautifully summarized in 2 Corinthians 5.17, where we read, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Living as citizens of heaven in this world means that our actions, choices, and way of life reflect the values and principles of the kingdom of God, not worldly standards. We are called to love, serve, forgive, and seek justice, reflecting the light of Christ in every aspect of our existence. This gives us a clear mission and a purpose that transcends temporary pleasures and struggles guiding us toward eternity with God. The message of 2 Corinthians 5.17 is indeed powerful, showcasing the transformative effect of faith in Jesus Christ. Being in Christ is not just about believing in Him or following His teachings. It's about a deep, personal union with Him. This union forms the foundation of our identity and faith as believers. When the Bible describes believers in Christ as new creations, it points to a profound spiritual transformation that affects our thoughts and actions, significantly differentiating us from the world's pattern. Being a new creation implies a unique transformation that goes beyond external changes. It's a spiritual and internal transformation that, consequently, reflects outwardly. It's akin to being reborn, where the old way of living, the values, and the worldview are radically altered. The old life, with its habits, patterns, and sins, is replaced by a new life, characterized by spiritual vitality and a renewed sense of purpose and direction. Embracing our foreign identity implies recognizing our spiritual journey as outsiders in this world. We are chosen and transformed, living under a new rule, serving a new king, and indulging in new desires. It's fascinating to consider that while we search for life in the heavens, we see ourselves in a spiritual sense as strangers, traversing this world in search of a heavenly home. Romans 12, 1, 2 guides us not to conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Paul instructs us to avoid conformity with the world's standards, alerting us not to be shaped or squeezed into its ways of thinking and acting. This involves dedicating our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is our rational and intelligent act of worship. We are called to be transformed and progressively changed as we spiritually mature, focusing on divine values and ethical attitudes to discover for ourselves God's will, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. As believers in Christ, we are called to live differently from the ways of the world around us, following a path that reflects not just our heavenly citizenship, but also our divine mission and purpose in this world, until we reach our final destination alongside our King. The Christian instruction to not conform to the world, as presented by Paul and Peter, emphasizes a call to transformation and distinction in how believers live. It means actively resisting the corrupt practices, ungodly principles, and malicious action plans promoted by those who follow a worldly path. 
This non-conformity is grounded in the understanding that, though we live in the world, we should not be shaped or defined by its values and standards. Psalm 1. One underscores the blessedness of those who do not walk in step with the wicked, nor stand in the way that sinners take, nor sit in the company of mockers. This blessedness is an expression of the spiritual favor and prosperity that accompany obedience and fidelity to God, resisting the corrupting influences of the world. Christians are called to live by different principles, following Jesus Christ and shaping their lives after his example, rather than adopting the ways of life promoted by the world, which according to the Bible is under the control of the devil, described as the God of this age. In 1 Peter 2.21, we are reminded that we were called to follow Christ's example, who suffered for us, leaving us an example to follow. When the Bible talks about the world, it often refers not to the planet Earth itself, but to the moral and spiritual sphere dominated by values, attitudes and behaviors that are in disagreement with God's will. According to Galatians 1, 4, Christians are rescued from this present evil age, which is marked by idolatry, carnal desires and disobedience, indicating that we live in a period dominated by negative influences from which we need to spiritually and morally disengage. Despite living in the world, believers anticipate and experience the powers of the age to come, as mentioned in Hebrews 6.5. This means that Although physically present in this time and space, Christians are spiritually nourished and sustained by the reality of God's kingdom, which transcends this world's limitations and offers a perspective and power that challenge the established order. Therefore, not conforming to the world is a call to live in a way that reflects the reality of God's kingdom. In opposition to the patterns of the earthly realm dominated by principles contrary to God's, it's an invitation to be transformed by the renewing of the mind, allowing divine values, not worldly standards, to guide our lives and decisions. The understanding that we can be transformed to break free from conformity to the world is a crucial aspect of the Christian faith. The ability of believers to obey God in a natural and immediate manner is driven by the gift of the Holy Spirit who works to transform our hearts and minds from the inside out. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, 7, we are reminded that we have been made competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter that kills, but of the spirit that gives life. The contrast between the old covenant, which condemned because of sin, and the new, which brings life, underscores the transformative work of the spirit in our lives. Prayer is a powerful tool for connection and strengthening in difficult times. When we feel the weight of the world on us, we can find solace and strength in God. He is our pillar of strength and source of comfort, remembering that we are not alone and that with God's help, we can face any challenge is fundamental to our faith journey. Asking God for the strength to persevere and trusting in His Word for guidance and support are core practices that keep us anchored and motivated to live according to the principles of the Kingdom, regardless of the adversities we may face. The Christian faith offers us a unique perspective on life and our challenges. It teaches us that, through faith in Christ and with the help of the Holy Spirit, we have access to a strength that goes beyond our human capacity. This enables us to live in a way that not only resists conformity to the world, but also reflects God's glory and goodness to those around us. Therefore, with full confidence in the Bible, we can discover that there is a way of living that transcends the limitations of this world. The transformation that occurs in us through the Spirit enables us to live lives that witness the transformative power of the gospel, not just for our own benefit, but also for the edification and hope of others. It is in this transformation that we find true freedom and purpose, living as lights in a world that can often seem shrouded in darkness. Discover in the first comment our exclusive ebook on how to overcome challenges and live an abundant life that you need to know. Click now.